I could tell you exactly what a neshama is. You must be amazed, right? But it's a clear verse in the Chumash. Um, do we have a Chumash here, Bracious? Right? That's a Chumash? It is. The Torah describes very graphically the creation of a human being. And let me read it to you. It's chapter 2, verse 7. I encourage the fellows to memorize that posik. It's a very simple posik to, to remember. Let me read it to you. Chapter 2, chapter 2. Verse 7. I'll read it in Hebrew and then I'll read the English translation. Vayitza Hashem Elokim et Adam Afar min Adama Vayipach Baapav Nishmat Chayim Vayihi Adam Lenefesh Chaya. There are three phrases in this Posik. The first phrase is, Vayitza Hashem Elokim es ha'odam et ha'adam afa min ha'adama. I read the English. And Hashem, God, formed the man of dust from the ground. Phrase one. Phrase two. And he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, phrase two. So he first formed the body of man, dust from the earth. He then blew into his nostrils the soul of life. The third phrase in that Parsik, and man became a being that is alive. Three phrases. God formed. That's how he translates. That's how they translate the word Vayitzer. Vayitzer, he translates as an Hashem God formed. But the word Yitzira could also be understood in the sense of creation. But in other words, God created a formed existence. And that, that's what is the form. The form is this, the body. And he, what did he create the body from? Dust of the earth. Dust from the ground. Now where does the neshama come? Over there it doesn't say that God created it. It doesn't say that God formed it. So where did it come from? He come Shem blew. Now, if you blow out, where is the air that you're blowing out coming from? Lungs. From your lungs, from the inside of you. The Medrash says, Man de nafach, one who blows or breathes, breathes from within, mididay nafach. One who breathes, breathes air from within himself. So God did not create the neshama. God did not form the neshama, which he did to the body, right? God breathed or blew 
into this body, the nishmat chayim, the soul of life. That's an element that God did not have to form and that God did not have to create. That's an element that existed in God, whatever that means, of course, beyond us. But that's what the inner essence of the human being was. Today, it is the inner essence of the Jewish people. That's your neshama. That's what a neshama is, a breath of God. Yes. When it says um, they blew the uh, neshama, is that understood to be both types of neshamas at this point? There's, there's only one neshama. There's only one neshama, and the neshama is a breath that God breathed and that God or blue, the way the art scroll translates. Well, you know how they always like mention that, like Shabbat, we get an extra soul. And... Get an extra soul, right. That's an intensification of our neshama. And that intensification it, it is, it, it takes place only on Shabbos. That's, but it's not like there's another neshama. Okay. Right? We lose that intensification of the neshama, we lose after Shabbos. That we have during the Shabbos. That's why you can eat cholent and survive. The reason why? Because you have that extra neshama. That's it. Or else, lo and behold, there wouldn't be too many Jews in the world. Right? Yeah. So again, so we have a body that was created and it was formed dust from the ground. And then we have a neshama. Every single one of us has a neshama, has an, this breath that God blew or breathed into Adam when he created him. Well, how does the Pasuk end? Vayehi, and I must use the Hebrew, again, God blew what into us? A neshama. What did we become? Vayehi ha'adam lenefesh chaya. A nefesh. There are two things. There's a neshama and there's a nefesh. The neshama is the pure transcendent element that is divine completely, that emanated from Hashem. When that combined with that purely physical element, dust from the ground, there are, there are no two greater differences in existence. The breath of the creator with the dust from the ground. You're going from the bottom to the top. That's what we are. We contain the entirety of existence and that's why you will discover after 120 years, when we all stand and give an accounting for our lives, we will be held responsible for the entirety of existence. Not for myself, not for my community, not for my world. We, every single one of us, is responsible for the entirety of existence. If we live our lives properly and correctly, we, in, we put in to the world the energy of existence and the world becomes wholesome, vibrant, dynamic, healthy. And if we don't live properly, so then the, we weaken the world. We make the world weak. That's what HaKadosh Baruch Hu did, combined the, the, the lowest thing he created, the dust from the ground, with the highest thing that exists, a breath of himself, combine the two together. Those two together became a living nefesh, a nefesh chaya. That's what the nefesh is. So we have th three parts to ourselves. We have a body, flesh and blood, we have a neshama. It's a breath 
pure, very transcendent, divine existence. And then we have something in the center. That's us. That's the nefesh. That's our middle. Right? In the language of the Arizal, it's called, the lowest part is called the nefesh. The upper part, the highest part, is called the, nesh- the neshama. And the in-between is called the ruach, the spirit, the ruach. That's, so that's, again, that's what a neshama is. A neshama is an extremely divinely transcendent element that emanated from the creator. It does not say being formed or it doesn't say created. It says that God breathed it into us, or as the art scroll translates, blew it into us. And when one blows, when one breathes out, one breathes out something from within himself. Again, that's not something that I know what that is. I, but but, that, but that's, that's what the neshama is. And that's why we are, every single one of us has an extreme power. And, and we have to be careful to use that power correctly. I don't mean to give Musa in any way, but that's, uh, we, every single one of us is a very powerful creature, a creature that contains within it its life, the life essence of, of every single one of us is a divine element that, that gives to us great power. And if we live our lives the way we're supposed to live our lives, we will accomplish what we're supposed to accomplish. Any questions? No? no. Why, why were we so much more connected with Hashem back uh, when there was the you know, first Beth Migdash, second Beth Migdash, and um, <coughs> you know, then at mm-hmm. some point we decided to have, you know, Sidalim and set prayers and right. so is it like we have lost a little bit of the neshama that was breathed into Adam or I don't it? think we lost it the only the what happened was the exterior became thicker and the interior that in essence is at a greater distance from us we need we need there's a, a a Beta Mikdash we were meant to have always, and ultimately we will have the Beta Mikdash. But the, uh, the reason why we do not have prophecy today, and there is no communication between God and man, there was uh, during the times of Tanakh, they, uh, they, they were, there was communication between God and man. There, there were Prophets. A prophet was a human being that had a direct that God spoke to. So granted, he didn't speak to the prophet at the same level that he spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu. To Moshe Rabbeinu, he spoke pel pe. With Mamish, there was some direct dialogue. But a, a, a prophet cannot hear the words of God while he's awake, he has to, he, he goes into some type of a fit, right? and he faints when, when he receives his prophecy. And he, he sees it as a vision. He does, Maish Rabbeinu spoke fully awake, spoke to Hashem. But that was Moshe Rabbeinu. But the, what, as, as the, the level what is the source of the kedusha, of the sanctity of the Jewish people? The source of the sanctity of the Jewish people is the giving of the Torah. That's where it all started, and that's the root of the kedusha of the Jewish people is the giving of the Torah. Now, as we 
went further and further away from that root, it, its impact was less and less felt. One needed to dig deeper and deeper in order to connect with that influence, with the influence from that root. And up until today, when, when unfortunately we almost totally disconnected from it, and it's only in the yeshiva environment that one has a little feeling of what's, uh, what's happening, right, of, of truly what's happening. So as we f went further and further away, more and more had to be openly revealed in order to give us the opportunity that we should be able to delve into the inner depths and, can, and reconnect with that true source. And that's, that, that's why along, along our history, there were certain points where someone arose that was able to take us inside, to reveal to us the inner dimensions of Torah. It happened with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and then it happened afterwards the Ramban, and then afterwards it happened with the Ramchal, Lutzato, and then it happened with the Gro, and it would, before the Gro, before the Ramchal, it happened with the Arizal. The Arizal that was here in Eretz Yisrael, the Arizal was, was the one that brought to life the most inner dimensions of Torah. That up until the Arizal, it was given from a single person to a single person. That's it. It was not transmitted openly at all. The Arizal was the first one that gave it over to a group of people. And from that group is where everything that we have today, where, where, that's where we got it from. That's, that's what, what you call Kabbalah. That's, uh, those are the secrets of the Torah, that is the inner dimension of the Torah. So why is it, if there's plenty of great learning going on right now, there's plenty yeah. of who are devoting their whole lives to the source, the Torah study. Right. And why can't people who are from birth until, you know, Admir mm. Veslim, you know, studying Torah, why can't they elevate themselves to... They are more and more. There are more and more people today that are involved in the inner dimensions of Torah. There are more and more people. Right? But these people normally do not advertise themselves. But there are more and more people, more and more people that are knowledgeable in those areas of Torah. And, uh, and, it, and it's spreading. It's, it's expanding. Yeah. Yeah. Until Mashiach will come. That's it. And Mashiach will come. And then the Torah will be open. He'll open up the Torah. Yeah. But we have access to that today. This is one of the Svarim that where he writes the inner dimensions of Torah in our language. And it's, uh, that's why I strongly recommend. You don't need this copy that has a Pirush on. It's the, sufficient to have the Hebrew with Rabaria Kaplan's translation. You should read it from cover to cover, know it well, read it once, twice, three times, 10 times, 20 times, till you know it well. It's a systematic, almost scientific explain, explanation of everything that a Jew is supposed to believe in. Very clear, very, and Rabaria Kaplan wrote an excellent translation, yeah, an excellent translation. The question is, 
wh where and what happened that all of a sudden, remember again, how many human beings did God create? One. One. He did not even create a separate man and a woman. He created Adam that was both components, male and female. All right? Within Adam, there was a duplicity. He had Zachar, male and female, within himself. Kodesh Baruch saw that that wasn't whatever that means. Lo tov heyota adam levado. wasn't good that man should be alone. So he split him in two. And then he tells him, now it's your responsibility to create the unity. Al Cain, therefore, Yazov ish et aviv therefore a man should leave his mother and father, v'davak be'ishto, and cleave unto his wife, v'hayu, and they should become basar echad, one flesh. Proper Jewish marriage is, the Torah does not speak from speak, the Torah is not talking about nishomas, the Torah is talking about the flesh. A proper marriage, a Jewish marriage, is where the husband and the wife become one body, one flesh. The mamish one. They originally shared the, the, the same nisham. So that didn't have to be made into one. What has to be made into one is that part of that nishama was deposited in him, and part of that nishama was deposited in her. So that's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells, tells him, join, cleave unto your wife, and become one flesh. And because we share, that's a proper Jewish marriage. That's what's called bashert. I don't know if you heard the word, bashert, right? That the zivug was predestined from the time when the child, when the little boy is born and the little boy, boy, girl is born. So the shidduch is made in the heavens. That's it. Because they are one and they have to return to being one. So since God created a single human being, so then the, the question is where did the two kinds of human beings come from? Where did Jews and non Jews come from? Why is there such a thing as Yisrael and the nations of the world? Which, pardon? The, the Tower of Bavel, when they were split into different that's, that's where it started. True, very good. That's where it started. It started when God divided the humanity into 70 nations. Who was excluded from that division? Cain. Pardon? Cain? Cain? Or Noah? No, 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 not Cain and not Noah, because that took place in the 20th generation. The, the separation, the division of humanity took place in on or about the year 2000. You all are familiar that we are today in 5,774. On or about, give and take, right? I don't know how much to give and take, but the, uh, the, the, the division of humanity into 70 distinctly different parts took place in the, uh, on or about the year 2000, in the 20th generation of humanity. There were 10 generations from Adam till Noah, and there were 10 generations from Noah till Abraham Avinu. The separation of humanity took place in, uh, during the time of Avraham Avinu. He was either 52 years old when it happened, or 48 years old. Now it's like when Noah, you know, the whole promise was that he would never destroy uh, you know, the people of the earth again. Right. But splitting up the people is kind of like destroying the you know, unity, at least. Right. You know, you didn't just but remember, remember what happened. What did the unity 
of humanity lead to? They were trying to reach the heavens. They were trying to build the tower, the tower of Bavel, Migdal Bavel, the tower of Bavel, right? What were they attempting to do? They had a technology that we do not have yet. They had a technology, and it, it appears from the Chumash that a Kodesh Baruch Hu was afraid they would be able to do what they wanted to do. And what did they want to do? They wanted to build this tower to the heavens and disconnect so that Hashem should not be able to interfere with what is happening here. I, it's beyond me, but that's what it says. Those are the words. That you may, and why were they able to do that? The reason why they were able to do that is because they all spoke the same language. They all were able to cooperate with each other. So they unified together, they created this unity, and used that uni unity in an attempt to rebel against God. So God said, enough unity, that's it. We divide them in 70 distinct nations, each nation with its own language. What happened after each nation had his own language? So one fellow from one nation told a fellow from the other nation, please pass me the brick because they wanted to continue to build the tower. And meanwhile, now he didn't understand what he was talking about, so he thought he was cursing him. So he, instead of passing the brick, took him, hit him over the head with the brick. War. That's what happened. We couldn't talk to each other. We didn't understand each other. So we fought with each other. That's, so that's, Hashem accomplished his purpose. He divided humanity. And no longer would, would humanity unite together in order to rebel against him. It is probably extremely significant in leading up to Mashiach that not too many years ago, 60 or 70 years ago, after World War I, right, there was formed by the nations of the world the United Nations. That is probably, again, I'm not a historical analyst, but Mashiach will say when he comes, he will explain it. But I've, I feel personally that the United Nations is a step in the direction of the reunification of humanity, even though, meanwhile, they aren't very favorable to our people. Even though we're reaching some of the same conditions, to be able to communicate with each other. We're putting right. Dubai, you know, some... That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Whoever sits in the, in, in the United Nations, if you sit in the General Assembly, you can understand what everyone is talking about, no matter what language. It's all translated into our English. That's it. That's also... That's not an original, original language, right? It's interesting that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the international language English. There are things you should know. Things do not happen by chance. Everything that happens is a reason for it, and he's taking care of everything. But it's a bit beyond us to understand it, but I hope I'll be there. You surely will all be there. I, uh, I heard from a very big Talmud Chachon that people your age will surely see Mashiach. And I feel very confident, and I hope I'll be there also. So you'll tell me if I was right or not. I feel very confident that the first shiurim that Mashiach is going to give are going to be history. He's going to explain every detail in history, how those details were necessary for his arrival. I um, feel very confident that that's what's going to be.
And you'll see it, Yitz Hashem. I hope I'll be there too. We believe that he's coming every day. Today he's coming. That's it. I, I. Yes, you want to ask? Well, it's not personally a class, it's in your first time, but there's like a Kabbalist rabbi that lives in the old city. Do you remember? There is a what? A major Kabbalist rabbi that lives in the old city. Old city, do you know his name? I was going to ask you if you knew his name. Mm. Like a very well known rabbi. Um, in the old city? I hear there's yeah. in Bnei Brak, there's a lot of very. Uh, well, he lives repute, res, reputable rabbis. Yeah. I had Shabbat dinner with him last year, and he told me a lot of things that did come to pass the past year. I kind of mm. want to check him down. Uh, he told me like 20 things that all came to pass in the past year that were like kind of crazy. <laughs> but the, those who those who know the Kabbalah might have access. The people that I know, my rebbe's, I have two rebbe's. One lives in Harnof, and the other one lives in Bayit Vagan, and they are great experts in the in, in the inner dimensions of Torah. Right? And uh, that good. Anything else you'd like to ask? So again, what I would like to learn with you, what I get, was... I have, sorry, one, one more question. But please. please. No, because I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes because I didn't have a mincha yet today. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you know, uh, did you ever hear of the Torah code? The, oh, the Torah what? The Torah code. Yeah. Yes. And what do you think? I don't know if it's if it's true or not, but it, it, it's no. Again, there's no question in my mind that the Torah is a divinely revealed document, and that I would not be surprised that all that all the secrets, not only of history, but all the secrets of science of the universe, are all encoded in the Torah. There is a very famous medrash that says, Histakil, histakel ba'oraita ubroa alma. Hashem gazed into the Torah and created the world. In other words, the whole, all, we're not only talking about our planet, we're talking about the universe. Everything, everything that God created, the totality of the universe, God gazed into the Torah and created. So there is a root for the furthest most star. There's a root in the Torah, either in a letter, in a part of the letter, in a vowel, or maybe in the cantillation. But someplace in the Torah, there is the source of everything that exists in the world. God gazed into the Torah and created the world. There's nothing that he created that doesn't have its source in the Torah. Therefore, I would not be surprised. I would be surprised the other way. But that it could very well be something that only Mashiach has access to. There, it could be there are people today that have an in-depth understanding of the Torah, of the revealed Torah, of the, the inner part of the Torah, to the extent that they might have inklings about things. But I don't think they have a true in-depth understanding. Maybe they do. But I mean, I'm so far from it, I can't even possibly think of it. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to ask before? We start. I'm just going to, one paragraph, because I didn't have a mincha yet, and I want to have a mincha at 5 o'clock. So I'm, I'm starting. One of the deepest concepts of God's providence involves Israel and the other nations. Again, I repeat, and I repeat with an emphasis, God created a single human being with regard, I read on, with regard to their basic human characteristics, the two appear exactly alike. From the Torah's viewpoint, however, the two are completely different 
and are treated as if they belonged to completely different species. That's an amazing, amazing statement. Right? Right? That the nations, the, the Jew and the non-Jew is looked at as if they are two different species. In the morning, when you daven, in the brachas that we say, we make a bracha that you did not make me a woman, because right? a woman has less mitzvahs. So the difference between a man and a woman is, we all know, is great, it's a tremendous difference. The same, we, we make a bracha, shelo asani goy. You did not make me a Gentile. The difference between the Gentile and the Jew is there's a, a, a real, real difference. He says, he goes on, we will now delve into this concept, explaining in which way the two are alike, as well as in which way they are different. A little bit more. Before Adam sinned, he was on a much higher level than contemporary man, as discussed earlier. In that state, man was on a very lofty level, fit for a high degree of eternal excellence. I stress the word eternal. When God created man, was there such a thing as death in the world? No, absolutely not. When God tells man, Adam, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden, he tells him, do not eat from that tree because the day you eat from that tree, you will die. You don't eat from that tree? There's no such thing as death. Eternal. That's what he's saying over here. He was in that state, man was on a very lofty, lofty level, fit for a high degree of eternal excellence. If he had not sinned, man would have simply been able to elevate and perfect himself step by step. Hashem left over, I might have told this to you already, Hashem left over one thing in the world to show us what the world could have been like. How do you have not sinned? And that is wine. wine. That's it. The older it gets, if, I don't know if you really ever tasted an old, aged, mellow wine. Absolutely delicious. delicious. But of course, about $100 a bottle. Right? So we can't afford it very often. Right? To say they got more. Pardon? Nichnas yayin That's right. That's why, that's, why, that's, why, that's, that's the salt. The secret I don't know if you know, what, what's your name? Josh. Josh, I don't know what Josh was referring to. Yayin, is, are you all familiar that Hebrew letters have numerical values? Gematria, yeah. Gematria, right? So ya, a yud is how much? Something. A yud is 10. A yud, a, a, yayin is yud, yud, nun. A nun is 50, and the two yuds are 20, that's 70. The word secret in Hebrew is samach, is 60. Vav is 6, 66. Dalit is 4, 70. Nichnas yayin, yayin, wine goes in, out comes out the secret. That's right. If you drink a little bit too much, so then you say secrets. And, but there, it works in a positive way also, not only in a negative way that there is a secret within us. That secret is eternal life. And through the wine, we can reveal that eternal essence of ourselves. And that we do one day a year. 
and that's on Purim. That's it. That's when we drink the wine, and out comes our, our eternity. Haman represented terminality, death, and we represent life. Amalek and Israel.